Lord. We've come into this house to magnify your name, to worship you. Lord, we've come into this place to magnify your name and worship you. We have come into this place to magnify your name, just to worship Christ our King. Oh, we worship you, Jesus Christ, our King. And we'll lift up holy hands. We magnify your name. We worship you. We will lift up holy hands. We'll magnify you, Lord. We worship you. We'll lift up holy hands, magnify your name, and we'll worship Christ, our King. Oh, we worship you, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes, Lord. Well... Somebody asked me if I had a sermon, and I said, I'm not sure I have a sermon. I have a message, just not sure I have a sermon. I think the message has already been preached quite a bit today. From the songs that we sing, there is a river. There is a river. Spring up, oh well, there is a river. There is a river. There is life in the river. Get in the river. <laughs> It's the Holy Spirit's call to come into his presence. We, uh, we are living in some very interesting times where the very life can be snuffed out inside of us, you know, and we, uh, the very breath can be squeezed out of us, if you will. And uh, we, can't, we can't stand by and just let that happen. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, you ever heard of The Walking Dead? Come on, I know that you know the show, The Walking Dead. Okay. Well, I don't know much about The Walking Dead. I've, I've never really watched an episode. But it kind of struck me the other day. Dad, why don't you take a look at that and see what the whole thing is? So I did. I sat down and I watched one episode. I didn't quite get it. I just saw a bunch of, you know, and, and scared people, you know, trying to survive, trying to thrive, trying to not get eaten alive or infected. Because if you got infected, then you would become like one of them, walking dead. I fear that there is a lot of walking dead among us. With our life snuffed out of us, we're just existing, you know? And uh, so I looked it, I looked it up on, uh, online, and uh, it says, The Walking Dead is a fictional story of apocalyptic invasion of zombies. Civilizations, foundations collapsed with the overwhelming of their social structures, law enforcement, and military structures by these things, and uh, only a remnant of survivors was left among the living. Zombies will eat you alive, at least infect you, and turn you into one of them, the walking dead. Now, that's a true crisis. <laughs> But we kind of have a parallel time where we are in a, in a period of crises in America and it threatens to really snuff out the life within us and cause us to become like walking dead men unless we find a way to ignite the life of God within us. The Spirit of God has got to come alive in us in order for us to not just survive but to thrive. And that's the call of the Spirit this morning. Now, how does that happen? 
Well, David. David had a answer. And David faced many crises in his, in his life as, as not only pre-king, you know, with his having to run from Saul and deal with Saul, but after he was a king, he had many people that wanted to usurp his authority and his, overthrow his government. And uh, he wrote Psalm 11, and I want you to turn there if you do have your Bibles. And Psalm 11 says this, Verse three, first, if, if, the, if the foundations, if those structures, if those governmental, moral governmental structures of your civilization, your social life are destroyed, then what will the righteous do? So in Psalm 11, David has... An answer, and this is what he says. Verse 3 says, When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? David, in verse 2, says, Look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. It was like lawlessness was taking over. It was like chaos was entering into, into, the, uh, into the social system and into the government. And, and David describes it as wicked are bending their bows and setting their arrows against the strings ready to shoot from the shadows. That, that sort of talks, speaks to me of deception and hiding and and uh, you just don't, you know, hidden corruption and so forth. And David says, they're shooting at the upright in heart. And his counselors told him in verse 1, flee like a bird to the mountains. David's re response was, how can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? He's, David says, that he had a choice here to fight or take flight. And many of us, when we, when we feel squeezed by the pessimism, the negativity, the fearfulness, the despair of what we feel closing in around us, we have this choice to either fight or flight, take flight. Take flight, you know, for many of us, can take the form of escapism. You know, that's when Bud and Jack become your two best friends. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever, whoever. That's the wrong place to find comfort and strength. His choice was to, take, was to fight or take flight, but David was a mighty warrior. And his secret and his strategy is found in verse 1. And it says that in the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? Verse 4, he said, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He knew where to find strength. In, in uh, Psalm 18, he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. My deliverer, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield and he's the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. It's in his presence. That's where I am strong. In his presence, the Lord my God. In his presence, that's where I belong. Seeking his face, touching his grace in the cleft of the rock. It's in your presence, it's in your presence, O oh Lord. That's the strategy, that's the secret. That's how we fight our battles, in his presence. Remember that old song, Staying Alive? 
Staying alive, staying alive. Staying alive. Come on, I know that some of you in here know that. Bee Gees old song, Staying Alive. Staying alive is where, in the presence of the Lord, that's where we're going to stay alive in times like these. And that's how we are going to fight our battles and don't become like walking dead men. Now, this is a choice. This is intentional. This is a call that we can say yes or no to. To get into his presence is like intentionally choosing to position myself before him. You know what I mean? Moses, the very last words that he spoke to the nation of Israel before they went in to take the land, he said, I'm setting before you life or death, blessings or curse. Therefore, choose life that you may live and prosper in the land, you and your children and your children after you. So it's the choices that we make today to bring ourselves into the presence of God. This is a very, very pragmatic choice, very, very pragmatic positioning. It's intentional. In your presence, that's where I am strong. In your presence, that's where I belong. Seeking your face. How do I fight my battles? For me, it's on my knees. It's on my knees in his presence. You see, Jesus put it like this. I'm the bread of life. Come down from heaven. If you will eat of me and drink of me, you will live. If we don't eat and drink daily, we won't get nourishment for this whole body. Same thing with our spiritual bodies, with our spirit inside. If we do not get daily nourishment, we will die. We will become like walking, walking, so you're alive, kind of, but you're dead, really, inside. There's no life in you. And you look at somebody and their eyes are dull. And their facial characteristics are fallen. You know that something's going on. They're, they look like dead men walking. It's called the countenance. And the countenance can tell the story of what is going on in, inside, whether there is life or whether there is death. Choose life that you may live. Well, how do we do that? We get into his presence. John 6, 35, I, and I wrote a lot of scriptures here, and um, I have more scriptures than I do notes. But the scriptures are the words of life, not just my notes. So, Jesus said in, in, in John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me won't hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. John 6, 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. Isaiah 55 one through three, Isaiah. Actually, you can hear God speaking to the people through Isaiah. And he says, ho or hey, you all, every one of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Buy wine, buy milk without cost. And then he poses the question, why do, you, why do you spend your money or your resources on that which doesn't satisfy? Why?
when we are feeling dead on the inside, we tend to run after every other thing that we think is going to bring us life. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. God says, come, all of you who are thirsty and you who have no money and buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Quit spending your money on what doesn't satisfy and your labor on what does not satisfy. Then he says, to reinforce it, give ear. Give ear. Listen, are you hearing this? Hear it so that your soul may live. Jesus, on the last great day of the feast, it was the last great day of the feast in Jerusalem, it says that he stood up among thousands of the people there gathered. And it says that he cried out in a loud voice. And what did he say? He quotes that same scripture in Isaiah 55 in John 7, 37. He says, on that last day, he stands up with a loud voice and it says, if anybody is thirsty, any one of you, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, streams of living water will flow from him. Spring up, oh well. Streams of living water will flow from him. And by this, he meant the spirit of the living God, whom those who believed were to receive. Are you full of the Spirit of God this morning? See, the call is to come and be filled full of the Spirit of God. Get into His presence and get full of Him instead of being full of everything else around you. We get so, we get so enamored or could I say, beaten over the head with so many voices, especially right now, voices that are negative, voices that are vengeful, voices that are angry, voices that are bitter, voices that are causing uh, uh, chaos and crises and, and breaches of relationships and causing fear of the future. The voice I hear is come to me and drink and listen to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Get into my presence and eat and drink of me. John 4, 10, John states, if you knew Jesus talking, Jesus talking to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him. And he'd give you living water. That was the Samaritan woman at the well. Talk about being in a fix. You might say in a dry and thirsty land, she had had four or five husbands and the one she was living with was not her husband. She was living in shame and in fear of the community of what they thought of her and she was coming to the well at noon, high noon when it was hot instead of early in the morning with all the rest of them because she was living in shame, rejection. And Jesus stops and he talks to her. Jesus is full of life. And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask him and he would give you <laughs> the water of life. You'll never thirst again. Come, come, all you who are thirsty. Let's get into his presence and get full of his spirit. Everyone who drinks this water will be never, 
this water, he said, of the well would be thirsty again. Everyone who drinks of this water I give him will never thirst again. And it will be like a well of water or a spring of water welling up within him. You know, it's, it is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly to the full and running over. So choose life or become like those old walking dead. And it becomes an intentional thing as opposed to, it's intentional, you know, f as opposed to living by the seat of your pants, if you will. I mean, I, I, I just don't know how else to put it. John 15, 4, he says, if you will, Jesus is talking again, if you will abide in me and I in you, the, he says, the branch cannot bear fruit on its own. In other words, you can't, you can't bring forth life if you're not abiding in the vine. You're a branch. And if you're not in the vine, you're, you have no life in you. But he said that if you will abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll bring forth fruit. <laughs> you, 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 you see this Bible? This is the Bible that I bought when I first came back to the Lord. It's pretty messed up. Covers are all rubbed off. I used to take it and go, in, go into the bathroom and put this on my head like so. And tell God, here I am. You've got to download something in me because I just don't know how to think or see or act anymore, Lord. But here I am. I need you to talk to me. I need you to speak to me. I need you. I need your presence, God. I don't want to be like a walking dead man anymore. And so I begin to search him. That's what this, that's what this word says right here on the front of this man kneeling down, seeking the Lord. He says that you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 1, David says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of those that scorn him. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law he meditates day and night. That man will be like a tree that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaves will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. But it, it's the man that meditates. David said that he meditates day and night on the word. He's after the life that comes from the word of God. I am the bread of life, God says. Bill has uh, pricked my heart with this term, the authentic church. The authentic church is full of authentic Christian men and women who are full of the Holy Spirit. They are not walking dead men. They are not the great pretenders, the ones that have just a form of Christianity, a form of godliness but don't have the reality and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them an authentic church is one who is full of the church full of the spirit of God and Paul describes it like this in his letter to Timothy he says that the church is a pillar and support of the truth an authentic church is one who has the reality and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit a at work in them, the life of God at work in their lives, and it's evident. Those old scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, they were, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs because they were beautiful on the outside, but they were full of dead men's bones. They looked good. They had the appearance 
They did the right things. They went to the temple. They did the washings. They did the sacrifices. They said the right words. They even prayed on the street corners loud so people could hear them and stuff. But they were not full of the spirit of the living God. They were not authentic. And God is calling us to real authentic life. And it's a real simple formula. It's in his presence. That's where I belong. In his presence, that's where I'm strong. Seeking his face, touching his grace in the cleft of the rock. I think you used the scripture Ezekiel 47 last week. I've used that scripture several times in the past over the years. Other men of God, I think uh, Chris Morari preached that, ser that sermon here once also. And we, I, I, with all my heart, I believe it is a template. Ezekiel 47 is a template for an authentic, alive church of the living God. <clears throat> it is a picture. It has three pictures there, actually, and three metaphors. Ezekiel 47, 1 to 12, it's water that flows from south of the temple and it gets deeper and deeper into the eastern regions and it goes down into the Araba, which is a desert, extremely dry place, and then it goes on down to the very lowest place of the earth and that's the Dead Sea. Aptly named, wouldn't you agree? The Dead Sea. I've been there. There's nothing, nothing alive there. Not even fish. But that river. And the angel of the Lord tells Ezekiel, this is a, a vision that he gives to Ezekiel. While Ezekiel is with the people of God in, in captivity in Babylon because they just rejected God for so long that finally God had to do something. You know, God withholds judgment as long as he can. Four years ago, I preached a sermon called Reprieve, Now What? You know, and reprieve, I believe that reprieve is, is, is basically the with, withholding of judgment or punishment for the purpose of reformation. And, and I believe that God in these last four years has been good enough to give us an opportunity to push back on the flow of evil and wickedness and, and, uh, and, and the turning away from his laws. But we see lawlessness increasing in our land now. We see, we see a, dis, a, a, a despising of life. I think it was something like 42 million babies were aborted this very year, this last year, 2020. And we just go on as if, oh well, that's just the new norm. We see our values being turned upside down, right is wrong and wrong is right. Confusion with our children. There's no absolutes for them any longer. They're set, set adrift on a sea of confusion and in a wild sea of ideas, and hardly knowing what to believe. And we've educated our children into actually ignorance and ungodliness. And we wonder, how long, God? How long? And we're filled with a, a culture of death instead of a culture of life. What, what can we do? God has the answer for us. He wants us to be his people that are full of life and not death. But we have to choose it. He says, there is a river. It's flowing from the temple. It's a picture. It's a metaphor. The river flows from the temple. The temple represents the presence and the power of the living God. And he says, if you will jump into that river, you can go with the flow. You will live. And everywhere you go, you'll bring life. Now, that river that flowed from the temple, in the picture, it says that it was ankle deep. And then the angel of the Lord measured off another thousand cubits and he says to Ezekiel who's watching this whole thing Ezekiel do you see this 
And Ezekiel's going, I guess so, you know, and it comes up another thousand cubits. It's up to his knees, another thousand cubits. It's up to the waist. And then it gets up to a, a, a depth where you couldn't even cross it. And you would just be swept away. The whole point. Ezekiel, do you see this? Get into that river of life and go with the flow. Because everywhere that river goes, it's going to bring life. That's the call to the church today. To bring life and not death. And it's not by our might. It's just by our choice. To agree with. To come into agreement. Dive into agreement. With the spirit of God. Get into the deep end. And go with the flow. The next picture you see is that there are trees springing up all along the banks of that river of life. And those roots of those trees are going down deep because, and they touch that river of life. And because they touch that river of life, that those trees grow up strong and true. And they, be, they, be, they, they start bearing fruit, but they don't bear fruit just in their season. They're so full of life that they're bearing fruit continuously. And their leaves, their leaves are for the healing of the nations. And, and their fruit is for the nourishment of the peoples. Choose life. He's calling us to be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. That bring forth fruit in its season. And then everything that we touch will prosper. For the healing of the nations. Ezekiel, do you see this? Fruit is for nourishment. It ain't just for you. Fruit is for you to give. Fruit is for you to bring life to the nations. And the leaves are for the healing of the woundedness. Those that are consumed with bitterness and rejection. Hey! There is a balm in Gilead. An authentic church is full of life, of the Spirit of God. The next picture you see is that that river, it's, it's running all the way to the lowest places. The lowest place on the face of the earth. The imagery here is incredible. God is so smart. And he inspires men to write. They don't even know what they're writing sometimes until later on the revelation comes and we begin to see the heart of God, the river of life flowing to the deepest, darkest, driest, lowest places on the face of the earth. Corey Ten Boom one time said to me, remember my son, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. When I was 19, here he is showing us that there is no pit that you have found yourself in. There is no depth. There is no lowliness of life that you have found yourself in that his life cannot reach you to. And when that river of life went down those that Arabah, that desert place, and it flowed down into that Dead Sea. It says that everything in that, everything in that Dead Sea began to spring up like multitudes of fish, like we're in the Mediterranean. Now they were alive and well in the Dead Sea. Everywhere that thing flowed, that river flows, comes to life, revives, restored. How many need a second breath, a fresh, fresh breath, a fresh wind in your own spirits today? There is a call to come. There's one more picture. And it says that there are fishermen that are posted all the way around that Dead Sea. 
Another picture of us as the people of the living God, church of the living God. It's time to go fishing. It's time to go fishing. Because there's lots and lots of fish now alive in that dead sea that, that need to be caught. It says that those, there were fishermen everywhere around that dead sea spreading their nets. That also is a choice to spread our nets, to bring nourishment, to bring healing, to bring fresh wind of life, to bring a fresh drink of life. That's the nature of an authentic church filled with the spirit of the living God. Amen, Lord. An authentic church prays. <laughs> and in Ezekiel chapter 22, God gives Ezekiel another vision, and it's a vision of the holy city. In a vision of the temple in the holy city of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, it's not too holy. And he's in 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 uh, actually calls it the bloody city. He says that the holy city is now lawless. It is corrupt. It is sexually immoral from top to bottom. From the princes, the leaders, officials, to the prophets, to the priests, and through all of the peoples. They were profaning God's holy things. Make, there was no distinction anymore between things holy and right and things profane. And God says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall, the wall of righteousness, and stand in the gap or the breach before me for that land so that I would not have to destroy it. In the heartbreak of God, he goes on to say, I found no one. I found no man. I believe that God is calling for men and women, big men and women, you know, not, not men and women that are little in, in mind, in little in thought, but big in, in, uh, in vision, able to see far horizon, things that can be. God was always asking Ezekiel, can you see this? Are you, are you perceiving this, Ezekiel? Do you see what I want to do? Can you see what the, what the conditions are? But can you see also the, this, the answer? And he was constantly asking Ezekiel. He's asking us if we can see this. He was looking for men and women who, who would build up that wall of righteousness, stand in the gap before him and intercede. That's kind of the role of a watchman. A, a watchman is conscious of the condition of the, of the flock. And he makes intercessions and intercedes for them on their behalf. I remember I'd go down... County Road 101 to work in Taylor. For years I've gone down that road and it's an old farm road, a county road. And, and about, a, about a mile and a half after I got onto this one county road, I would go down a dip and then up a hill. And then on the right side of this hill on, on a knoll, there was a bull. And that bull would stand there every day looking over the fence across the road to the pasture where there was a whole bunch of, just a herd of cattle. And it was like, there he was keeping watch over the flock, you know, over the herd. And the Lord would put it into my heart, Dave, that's your job. 
You're to stand there as a watchman and, and, and be aware and be conscious of the condition of your flock and pray over them and intercede over them and stand in the gap over them. Guard them. Care for them. Make, keep, keep them alive as far as it is dependent upon you. 1 Timothy 2, 1 says, I urge first of all that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Intercession. Do you know what intercession is? Intercession is prayer to God on behalf of, of another or others. That's a short definition. The Latin prefix inter, intercession, the Latin prefix inter means between. So we stand between others and God. And it's asking for favor or forgiveness, forgiveness for them. Or we stand be, between others and Satan, pleading for God's protection and deliverance for them. The Hebrew for the word intercession is pagah. And it means to light upon as if by chance to fall upon as in executing the king's decree or to reach unto as extending a boundary. Those are very powerful images for interceding for someone. Prayer turned the tide of history when men prayed. Mike said he woke up this morning praying I woke up yesterday morning with a verse from Psalm 2, 8 in my, uh, in my heart, in my mind, just going over and over. And, and the word is, ask me for the nations. Dave, ask me for the nations. Dave, ask for your nation. Ask for your neighbor, ask for your coworker. Ask for your husband, your wife, your grandchildren, your children. Ask, ask. A prayer warrior is like a hinge of history because prayer has such power. It prevails with God. Matthew 7, Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be open to you. It's actually a continuous sense. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock. Keep on knocking. I hear that call to pray. And I remembered hearing about Bill's exhortation that he felt sensed the call to prayer and there was people joining in prayer in his little group and then there was more and there was more and there was more. And we already see that happening among us, don't we? That we are, we are joining in prayer with one another and we're becoming spontaneous in prayer. That's what this means. We're to light upon as if by chance. Well, you know, Many times on my way to work, somebody comes to mind and I just begin to pray over them. And then the Spirit of God begins to help me to know how to pray for them. Because why? Because we don't know how to pray for ourselves sometimes. We don't know exactly, but the Spirit himself will aid us in that intercession. Spontaneously when somebody... But you know what? This, this requires us to be sensitive and to engage by choice. It's, this is an intentional thing to engage with the Holy Spirit. And when we pray and earnestly seek God, he says that he will open the doors, that he will, that he will change, move boundaries. Open doors, move boundaries. These are images of things taking place because we prayed and we engaged with God and the Spirit of God came in and directed our prayers and they became powerful tools, weapons. Of righteousness. In the right hand and in the left. Keys of the kingdom. That we can only get. When we are interacting. With the spirit of God. Sometimes just spontaneously. 
Sometimes he'll put something in our heart and it'll become like a decision that we make and it's like executing the king's decree. This is what I have said. Do it. And we do it with the power and the authority that comes from the living God. The other one is, is like extending a boundaries. When you pray, intercession in the spirit can be like moving boundaries, extending your tent stakes, if you will, extending your realm of influence, if you will. God will do that in the spirit as we engage with him, interact with him. But it's a choice that we make. Here is where a life, life, of adventure begins in the midst of a crisis. Here, here is where the fight begins. It's on our knees. Here is where he says, if you seek me, you will find me. And I will be found of you. An authentic church is a praying church. <laughs> I made these notes and decided to go ahead and throw them in. Uh, an authentic church is open to change. <laughs> My wife is a big one. So... You know, this one is hard on me. I like the good old things. I like the timeless traditions. I really don't like things to change. In my house, if I see something and I go, okay, that's where it needs to be. My wife will come along and... <laughs> Isn't that true? It's almost become a game. You know? And everybody... And we know... We, you know, we can walk through the door and something that's supposed to be right there, because I put it there, is over there. And something else is there. I'm, I'm not a... I don't really care much for change. But refusing to change can be a prescription for death. I'm trying to think of a good illustration here. I just don't want to be the old dog that just sits on the porch till death because he can't or won't learn some new tricks. So let's extend that a little. So an old dog that learns new tricks might be a, what do you call those helper dogs? Service dog. There might suddenly come to life a whole new purpose or meaning for that dog. Even dogs can come to life again. You can teach old dogs new tricks. I think it was Jesus that said in Mark 2.22 that nobody will pour in their right mind will pour new wine that hasn't fermented yet into an old wineskin. An old wineskin has already had wine in it that fermented, stretched it to its breaking point, and now it's hard and brittle. You put new wine into that old wineskin, and, and the new wine starts doing its job, that old wineskin's gonna break. And then it's dead, it's useless. Lost the wine. Lost the new wine. 
I don't want to lose the new wine. Because the new wine is where there's life. New life. That's the Spirit of God. So Lord, my prayer is that you would help me to be open, to be sensitive, to be pliable, to be tender of heart, to guard my heart with diligence, Lord, so that I don't get hardened, immovable, sarcastic, criticizing, critical, condemning, and then I call myself a Christian. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Pharisees and Sadducees were stuck in their old dead traditions. So sad, you see. They, they could not contain the new things of the kingdom of God that was coming and that was at hand. The new things of God and his kingdom are at hand right here in this body this morning and in your body. If so, the Holy Spirit, is you are full of him this morning. God told Isaiah in 43, Isaiah chapter 43, 18 and 19, he says, I want you to forget the old things. I want you to forget the former things. Behold... He chooses the words, behold, again. It's the same thing he's always asking those prophets. He wants to know if they're seers. He wants to know if they see it, if they're getting it. Do you see this, Ezekiel? Now he's asking Isaiah, do you see this? You need to forget the old stuff because I'm going to do a new thing. It's going to spring forth. The words. If you don't think this is the book of life, just read it from a literary point of view. The words the Holy Spirit inspires these guys to write are phenomenal because they so full of life and meaning. Behold, I do a new thing. Behold it. See it. You've got to have eyes to see. I'm going to do a new thing. Can you see it? I am going to make a way in the wilderness, that same wilderness where that river flowed. And, and I'm going to make streams or rivers in that desert. It's essentially the same metaphor. That old, that, that new song, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. When we get that, we might just start to see and behold something new that he wants to birth in our spirits so that we become authentic again. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Do a new thing in me. I am an old dog, but I can learn new tricks. Oh, there's another one. How about this? You ever seen a snake shed its skin? They need to. Because parasites get on that old skin and brings disease, and guess what? Inhibits the growth to the next stage of life. Let's shed our old skins. Let's get rid of the old wineskins, and let's give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. Begin to feed on 
the bread of life and drink from the river of life. It's intentional. And we'll see wonderful, amazing things take place even in this time of crises. Amen? Amen. Choose life. You know, this is um, so important that we get the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and restore authentic Christianity in the land, not just America, but all over the world. Um, I'm just going to say a few things real quick, and then we're going to close today by just everybody grab somebody and pray with them for the Holy Spirit to come, for rivers of living water to come. But I remember hearing some people thinking about, uh, was it Parler being taken down on the internet? And I've heard people talking about their fears of other voices being silenced and people aren't willing to listen to multiple sides and have civil dialogue anymore. And part of me just wonders if God is not hemming us in to realize that what this world needs is a church filled with Holy Ghost power. There is more power to reach the world in a church that is endued with power from on high than millions and millions of Twitter posts and social media. It's more powerful than the nightly news. It's more powerful than mountains of books. If the church is endued with power from on high, they will say these people have turned the world upside down again. And I know those words are foolishness to people who have never experienced it before. And even to people who have, it's almost like trying, you know, that's why Pastor David was preaching here, trying to wake people from our slumber to dare to believe these words are true. They are. And we need to start praying, in t dealing with our own hearts of unbelief, our own lack of expectation, our own looking to the things of, you know, looking to other things to break through when there's only one breakthrough, and that's through Jesus, and he's ordained it through the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to pray for us, but after we're done praying, I just want to encourage you to grab one or two or however many people you want and pray, Lord, manifest your presence, your power, and your glory. Manifest your Holy Spirit in our church in our family, in the nation, and on the earth. So, Father, these are the things that we're praying. We're hearing what you're saying. And we don't want to just be people that hear and hear and never do. Lord, I thank you that prayer has been increasing, that hunger has been increasing. But we pray, Lord God, that today that you would put a greater hunger, a greater passion, a greater expectation, a greater boldness, a greater brokenness in prayer into our lives. But it's not that we have prayed. It's the answers to prayer. And the greatest thing that we can pray for, as you taught us in your word, is to receive the Holy Spirit. So we ask you, Father, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon all your church throughout the world, that we would be endued with power from on high. Lord, I pray that you would awaken the anointing of your Holy Spirit in every one of your people's lives today in this room watching on the internet, but also across all the nations of the earth. Lord, that you would activate people's gifts, that you would cause us to bear fruit, that you would cause us to pray, that you would restore authentic apostolic Christianity in the earth. And that multitudes of people who are dead men walking would live again. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So just grab two or three people and just agree with that in prayer. And then we'll see you next week or at any of our meetings throughout the week. God bless you.